to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. This is the same scripture we used uh, this morning for sunrise service. and uh, We had a good crowd. We had about, I counted 35. I don't know if I counted right, but that's what I counted. If we want to count evangelistically, we had 45. But uh, anyway, uh, I appreciate, I appreciate all those who came. I appreciate all of you being here today. And I want you to know we love you. We love you with all our heart, and I mean that. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and begin with verse 1 and read through verse 7. And the Bible says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain, certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you today for this glorious event that we celebrate. God, it's so good to know that we serve a living Savior. So good to know that because he lives, Father, we shall live also. Lord, we ask thy blessings on this service today, on this portion of the service. For Father, Lord, we break the bread of life, thy word. And we ask you, Father, Lord, to take it and use it to accomplish thy purpose. Father, if there be one here today that's not saved, I pray, Lord, today that God they shall be. Father, I pray that we, as thy servants, that, God, you might draw us close to thee, ever close to thee, that, God, our hearts might reach out to you in love, and, God, Lord, that we might hear, Lord, what you have to say to us. And Father, may we leave this house rejoicing. May we leave this house praising you, and saying it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. Father, you have your way. Glorify thy son. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 This morning, as I think about the resurrection of the Lord, my mind, beloved, goes to the reaction. The reaction of his followers when they found, beloved, that the tomb was empty. The Bible tells us in the four Gospels, they were perplexed, confused. And that's what we talked about in sunrise service this morning. But it goes on to say, that beloved, after that, they were afraid. Then, beloved, they were unbelieving. And then, beloved, if you follow the story, they believed. They believed. But as the truth of the resurrection began, beloved, to settle in their minds and in their hearts, all those feelings and all those emotions must have turned to awe and to wonder. He was alive. He was alive. He, he had risen from the dead. And then, and then, beloved, they must have lapsed into thoughtful uh, contemplation 
as the question, beloved, arose in their minds, what? What does all of this mean? What, what does his resurrection mean? What does it mean? And that's the question, beloved, that we are going to consider this morning. Yes, he died. Praise God, he died for us. Yes, he was buried in that tomb. And yes, beloved, he rose from the dead. But what does the resurrection of Jesus mean? Folks, that question can't be answered in one sermon or a thousand sermons because it, it means so much. The resurrection means so much. In fact, beloved, every sermon, I thought about this, every sermon that has ever been preached since that day is based, beloved, on the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Every sermon that's ever been preached. But let me, let me share three thoughts with you this morning. Three truths, beloved, that we get from the resurrection of Christ. Three truths that flood my soul with joy, joy unspeakable. Folks, the first great truth is the most obvious one of all, the most obvious meaning for the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ, beloved, uh, means that death has been conquered. Boy, that's shouting ground. We ought to have people all across this place standing up right now. Death has been conquered. You that have lost loved ones, hey, death has been conquered. You, beloved, that are living and may face death, beloved, death has been conquered. That's what that resurrection means. Folks, death. What is death? Death is separation. It's separation. That's what the word means. Physical death, beloved, is the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. From the body. Once that happens, beloved, our bodies begin to corrupt. They begin to die. And oh, how we fear, beloved, physical death. We don't even want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. We avoid the subject as much as we can. But then, beloved, there is spiritual death. Spiritual or eternal death is separation of the soul from God. Beloved, it's separation of the soul from God into eternal torment. Eternal torment. Eternity in hell, separated from God's mercy, separated from all of God's comfort, separated from God's goodness, separated from God's presence in flames of fire. That, beloved, listen, is spiritual death or eternal death. Folks, these are, this, these are the first and second deaths that the Bible tells us that we face. These two, beloved, comprise what we call death. You know, death is what we fear most, isn't it? I mean, isn't it? Death, beloved, is what we dread. Death is, is, is our greatest uh, nightmare come true. And yet, beloved, death hangs over our heads from the time we are conceived. Death hangs over our heads. Death waits, beloved, in the shadows around us, to, uh, waiting to pounce upon us, to claim us and pull us down to that netherworld. And we all, we are susceptible to it because death, beloved, is the price of sin. For the wages of sin is death, God says. And we all, beloved, have sinned. We are all sinners. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So the sentence of death, 
is upon each and every one of us. Each and every one. And we think about that and we cry, what can we do? What, what can, where can we go? Who can conquer death for us so that we don't have to die? Oh, ye who are fearful of death, go back. Go back, beloved, to that Sunday morning as those women and those two disciples looked into the tomb of Jesus. What did they see? What do we see when we look in? We see, beloved, that the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen from the dead. He's risen. He's risen. Death, beloved, is conquered. That's what that empty tomb means. Now listen. He who died beyond a shadow of a doubt is alive. He's alive. He conquered physical and spiritual death, beloved. The enemy is defeated. The victory over death is won. It's won. Folks, that's what the resurrection means. We don't have to fear death anymore because Jesus has conquered it. He's conquered it. He overcame it, beloved, and became the first fruits of the dead. You say, preacher, what, what's the first fruits of the dead? Back in the book of Leviticus, God instructed Israel to offer a first fruit offering of the barley crop. And what they would do, beloved, they would go out just as the barley was beginning to ripen, when there was just a few stalks beginning to ripen. And they would gather, beloved, a sheep of, of, of barley, of, of the first fruits, they called it. And, beloved, it would be taken to the tabernacle or the temple, and it would be a wave offering to the Lord. They would wave that sheath to the Lord. Beloved, what that meant, beloved, was that, that, they were, that they were thanking God and praising God for the harvest that was to come. It was a promise. It was a guarantee that the harvest was coming, was coming. It was the guarantee, the promise that the harvest was coming. Those, those, that sheep, that first fruits was the promise. Now, beloved, think about that. There is a great harvest coming one day. And it's not going to be barley and it's not going to be wheat. But it's going to be a harvest of believers now with that in mind, look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. And that word sleep means those who have died and their bodies are asleep in the Lord. Look at verse 22, excuse me, verse 23. For every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Do you see? Jesus, beloved, died and rose again, conquering death and hell. He is the first fruits from the dead, but beloved, the harvest, the harvest of believers is coming. You know, we've had so many, so many that I love so much who have gone on to be with the Lord. But I'm telling you, because Jesus' tomb is empty, because he rose from the dead, one day the trumpet's gonna sound and all those saints that I remember, beloved, are going to rise in that great harvest and we who are alive will be caught up together to meet him in the air. Oh, thank God that the tomb was empty. I wish I could, I could stop, not stop right now and start calling names of so many who used to sit where you're sitting or over in that old church over there. But praise God, beloved, their bodies are going to rise. 
they are going to rise. No wonder, no wonder Paul said at the end of, of chapter 15, he spoke these words, for the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be the God, which giveth up the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Jesus has won the victory. Has won the victory. Oh, listen. Look this morning. Look at that empty tomb. He's risen. He's conquered our great enemy. And because he lives, we shall live also if we believe on him. Folks, as he arose, so shall we. So shall our loved ones who have passed on. That is what the resurrection means. That's what it means. Second, The Lord's resurrection means that nothing, listen to this, this is all shouting ground, that nothing in heaven or earth or hell below can stop God, beloved, from executing his plan. Nothing. Folks, this was all the plan of God. Before God created the world, Beloved, he knew that man would sin. He knew, beloved, that death would fall upon us and bring about our destruction. So God, you know nothing surprises God. God had a plan. He had a plan for man's salvation. I mean, before he laid the foundation of the earth, he had a plan. The plan was that God, beloved, would send his son to die in our place for the sins of the world, that his son would conquer death and hell and rise again. Look in your Bibles, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 20, uh, excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 20. Well, I mean, let, me, let me start before verse 20. 1 Peter, I've lost my place. 1 Peter Chapter 1, let me start with verse 18. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily, listen to this, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Folks, before the foundation of the world, God had this plan laid out. And you can believe this. When Jesus died on that cross, every evil spirit, every evil man wanted to stop him from rising from the dead. They wanted to stop him. Satan wanted to stop him. The fallen angels wanted to stop him, beloved. The Pharisees wanted to stop him. The the Romans wanted to stop him. All the evil powers of earth and and hell, beloved, wanted to stop Jesus from rising from the dead. But nothing, listen to me, nothing could stop God's plan. Nothing. Listen, listen at what they did. The Pharisees, they hated him. They hated him. They, beloved, are the one who instigated the crucifixion. Beloved, they were the most powerful religious sect in Israel. I don't mean just religious power, but also political power. Beloved, the Pharisees went to Pilate, and they said, that deceiver 
said that he would rise the third day. We want a guard to be at the, at the, at the tomb. We want it guarded so that his followers can't come and steal his body. Pilate said, see you to it. And they did. They brought in, beloved, the Roman guard to protect that tomb. Rome, Rome, the most powerful nation on earth at that time. Beloved, they took a stone and they rolled that stone over the door of his tomb. Now, I heard David Jeremiah say this. I hadn't checked on it and I think he's pretty reliable. I heard David Jeremiah say that, beloved, that stone, it took 15 to 20 men to move that stone. He said that theologians believe that, beloved, it weighed anywhere from a one and a half tons to two tons. And the Romans rolled that stone in front of his door. They were going to keep him in that tomb and keep others out. But that's not all they did. Beloved, they put a seal across that tomb, that, that stone. A Roman seal. Now that meant, beloved, that if anybody, anybody broke that seal, all the wrath of Rome would fall upon them. They would be executed. They would be killed. Folks, both religious and secular government did all they could to keep him, keep his body in that tomb. And what about his soul and his spirit? When Jesus died on the cross, beloved, his body went to the tomb. But his soul, his soul, beloved, went to Hades or Sheol in the Hebrew. Now, Hades or Sheol, listen to me, that was the place of the departed dead. Anybody who died went to Sheol or Hades, translated hell in your King James Bible. They went to this place, and this place was divided. On one side was paradise. That was where the believers went when they died. On the other side, beloved, was torment was flame and that's where the unbelievers went but it all was Hades or Sheol or hell or hell Jesus died on that cross and his soul went to the paradise side of Hades or hell so, so you see death and hell had him they had him, Satan, beloved, had him where he wanted in that prison called Hades. Hades. They had stopped him. They had stopped God's plan for three days. For three days. While his body was in that tomb, Jesus was there on the paradise side and folks, he was preaching up a storm. He was preaching to those believers who had died believing and trusting in his coming. He was telling them, I have come and I paid for your sin. I'm the one that you believed in. I'm the one that you trusted in to come, the Messiah. And I came and I died for your sin. He preached to those in prison, the Bible tells us. And Satan, Satan, as he preached, beloved, Satan and all the forces of hell laughed. They laughed because Jesus was in the grasp of death and hell. Oh, but on that third day, on that third day, hell began to quiver. Beloved, it began to shake under the power of God. Death said, no, no, I won't let you go. Hell groaned, beloved, as his gates were thrown open by the power of God. And the evil spirits, beloved, cried, stop him, stop him, stop Jesus. Oh, but 
nothing. Nothing, nothing, not the power of hell itself, not the power of death could withstand the power of God as Jesus fulfilled God's plan and arose from the dead. Wow! I gotta get this thing out of the way so I can hit the pulpit. Oh. Jesus fulfilled God's plan and rose from the dead. And for that stone, that two-ton stone, beloved, they found it flung away, thrown to the side like a piece of trash. And as for the Romans who guarded it, Beloved, they all, beloved, were laying as dead. They had fainted. They had, they had, had, had in fear, beloved. These seasoned warriors had passed out at the power and the presence of God. As for the soldiers, they were all as dead men. They were all as dead men. As for that seal, hey, God cares nothing about man's stuff. Beloved, that seal was broken and cast away. He was not afraid of Rome. He wasn't afraid. Folks, governments and religions, not even the powers of darkness itself can stop or prevent God's plan from coming to pass. That's what the resurrection means. That's what it means. So don't you let what governments do or religions do or what man does or what Satan himself does, beloved. Don't let it worry you. The resurrection means our God always wins and we win because we are all with him. We are with him. Third, third, the resurrection of our Lord means God has accepted the Lord's sacrifice for our sin. Folks, as important as the cross is, and let me tell you, it is so important. There's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood, and that's what he did, amen? Beloved, it is so important. But listen to what I'm going to say. It would be meaningless without the resurrection. Without the resurrection. The cross is where Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. It's where, beloved, he took all of God's wrath for our sin upon himself. All of God's anger at our sin. Jesus took it upon himself. It's where he paid the price for the sins of the world, beloved. The price was death. It's where he died. But if God the Father had not been satisfied with what Jesus did on that cross, what he paid on that cross, it would have all been to no avail Beloved, our sins, my sin, your sin, are against God. And God decides what it takes to pay for our sin. God, God. I got an old illustration. I've used it a million times. I'm going to use it again. When I was a little boy, my sister and I were playing in the living room. And mama kept telling us, y'all better calm down. You're going to break something. You're going to break something. Well, sure enough, my sister hit that thing. No, I don't know who hit it. But there was a little, mama had a little figurine of a boy on a swing. I'll never forget it. And that thing hit the floor and broke into a million pieces. Here come mama. I can hear her feet. Now fast walk. Here she comes. She come in there, boy, you could see the fumes coming up from her head. 
And she, she looked at that, and she looked at us standing in the middle of all that broken glass. I'll never forget what she said. She said, you go get a switch. And I knew what that meant, because we had a switch tree. I had to go break my own switch. You talk about carrying your own cross. Red and I had to go break my own switch. Now, breaking a switch is not an easy thing to do. It, you you got to take your time, you know. you got to get just the right one. I mean, it's got to be long enough and, 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 and limber enough to do the job. So I took all the time I could take choosing a switch. After a while, I saw Mama coming out the door. I knew it was time, so I broke one. And I went in there, and I... Handed it to Mama. And I said, Mama, I wish she was here to hear this. She heard it many times. I said, Mama, here's the switch. Now you go ahead and you whip me for what I did. And that little old thing was sticking up about like that. Just as limber as a rag. She could have beat me from now until eternity and I never felt it. And she looked at that and she said, no, that won't do. And she went to the tree, and she got one. And let me tell you something. She wore me out. But the point is, I had sinned against her. So she decided what it took to pay for that sin. Beloved, we have sinned against God. And God determines what it takes for, for our sins, beloved, to be forgiven, to be paid for. God looked, beloved, at his son, his son's own blood that had poured down from that cross, precious blood, innocent blood. God looked, beloved, at his son's terrible suffering, both physical suffering and spiritual suffering. And God looked, beloved, at his death, both physical and spiritual. And he weighed what Jesus endured against the sins of the world. And God said, I am satisfied. The price of sin has been paid in full. Come forth, my son. Come forth from hell in the grave and show the world, show them that I have accepted your sacrifice. That's what the resurrection means, folks. God is satisfied that the sins of man are paid through Jesus. It's God's seal of approval on all that Jesus did on that cross. And all we have to do is claim it. Claim it. And we do that by receiving and believing on Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, trusting him and his shed blood to save us. That empty tomb, that empty tomb means, beloved, that there is a way of salvation who, uh, uh, for, to all who will believe. Oh, thank God. God for the cross. Thank God. Thank God for the resurrection. Amen. On that resurrection morning, his disciples, his followers were perplexed and they were afraid and they were unbelieving and finally they were believing. And finally, they got around to the question, what does all of this mean? What does it mean? What does that empty tomb mean? What does the message from the angels mean? What does the sightings of the resurrected Lord mean? Do you know that over 500 saw him alive after his resurrection. 500 witnesses saw him. What does it mean? Oh, it means so many things. 
But it certainly means that death is conquered. You don't have to be afraid, Christian. You don't have to fear. It means, beloved, that nothing, nothing can stop God's plan from happening. Not governments, not religion, not the ideologies of man, not Satan himself. So you don't have to be afraid of all that's happening in this world. God's plan will come to pass. It will. And finally, the resurrection means that God is satisfied. The sin debt is paid and accepted that Jesus made on that cross. And all we have to do is believe and receive him as our Lord and our Savior. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful the tomb was empty? Aren't you thankful that we, and only we as a religion, beloved Christians, that we serve a risen Savior, a living Savior. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Oh, but the founder of our religion, Jesus, is alive. And because he lives, we shall live also. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Stand with me if you would.